All right. Well, welcome to um, our pause seminar. Um, after a long delay, we're back and we're really excited about today's presentations. Just to remind you about the format, we'll have 20 minutes per talk and then five minutes of Q&A and then 10 minutes at the end for general discussion. And we'll be giving the speakers a two minute reminder visually on screen um, when two minutes are left in your uh, time slot. So we're really excited today to uh, feature um, tree ring science broadly. Um, so we have two speakers. The first is Dr. Kevin Angikaitis, who's currently a professor of Earth Systems Geography at the University of Arizona. And Kevin has really pioneered using tree rings to understand temperature variability over the common era, as well as human environment relationships. And our second speaker is Dr. Karen King, um, who is currently a postdoctoral research scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, but will soon be an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, um, this coming fall. And she uses dendrochronology to investigate landscape scale dynamics, and will be focusing on the application of blue intensity methods um, to develop paleo temperature proxies. Um, a couple notes. Um, so PAUSE is led by the CESM Paleoclimate Working Group, and our goal is to provide a welcoming space for the open exchange of ideas and feature new developments in paleoclimate scientists. So please keep your comments respectful. Um, let this be a curiosity-driven discussion. And again, just a reminder on the format, um, and the recordings will be shared on YouTube after um, the seminar, so you can return to them anytime you want. And so I'm going to stop by share and let Kevin begin the discussion. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks to uh, the organizers uh, for having me and for everybody for being here today. Um, and uh, I'm excited about the, the way this is organized because basically uh, what I get to do is, is tell you about all the problems and the challenges. Um, and Karen's going to take over and tell you about the future and, and how we're going to solve those. Uh, and that seems uh, about right. So um, I'm, I'm really appreciating this format and the chance to talk about these things. Um, for those of you that might be interested in some more of the details beyond what 20 minutes can provide, um, myself and Jason Smearden uh, published this paper last year. Um, and, and so my talk today is really uh, based around uh, things we talked about um, in this paper in QSR. Um, and it was this paper was partially at least motivated um, by this figure from the summary for policymakers uh, in 2021, towards the end of that year um, of the IPCC. And um, you know, sort of on the right in panel B is, is a figure we've come to expect uh, that if you uh, run a climate model with both human uh, forcings and natural forcings, you can do a pretty good job reproducing the climate history of the last 150 years or so. And that natural factors uh, can account uh, for the rise in temperatures, particularly since sort of the middle of the 20th century. Um, but over on the left uh, in the A panel, I guess I was a little surprised uh, when I uh, first saw the SPM um, because uh, it uh, presents um, a single reconstruction uh, purportedly of global annual temperatures, in this case, uh, smooth to show decadal variability all the way back to the year one. Um, and uh, what's perhaps most surprising was the fact that the error bars uh, don't grow as you go back in time, as you might expect, and I'll talk about why that is. Um, in fact, the error bars are widest in a period where we have a substantial amount of proxy data there in sort of the, the little ice age from about 1400 um, in, into the, the late 1700s. Um, so uh, this reconstruction that was used in SPM and indeed is featured in several chapters in uh, the most recent uh, IPCC report uh, comes from this paper from the Pages 2K Consortium. Um, uh, came out in 2019. It, it builds on a database uh, that was led by Julien um with a host, I think about 90 other authors, um, that was put together of temperature-sensitive proxy data for the last 2,000 years. 
Um, and it, it uh, uses this data set to do reconstructions of temperature over the common era. Um, and they applied uh, a bunch of different techniques. So here I'm showing a figure from that paper. Uh, in the top panel, you see the sort of full spectrum of these reconstructions. Um, and all those uh, different lines with different colors and, and acronyms are different approaches you can use to assembling um, a network of, of proxy data into a reconstruction. And so you can see in some places they agree well, in other places um, they agree less well. Uh, and there's one particular approach, a Bayesian hierarchical model that gets uh, particularly cold sort of during the Little Ice Age, which is responsible for that odd feature of the uncertainty bounds being wider. Now, the focus of this paper was really, hey, if you actually remove the sort of lowest frequency, uh, this reconstruction uh, agrees pretty well on sort of this decadal, multi-decadal uh, scale. Um, some of that is, is almost certainly because uh, of the role of the same climate, or sorry, same paleoclimate proxy data going into it, um, but this was a focus of the paper. Um, and they say in this paper, actually, that the uncertainties for all the reconstructions, if you look at them, the different ones, the CPS reconstruction, the PCR, that Bayesian hierarchical model, um, these uncertainties increase back in time and are particularly large before sort of 1,000 uh, CE or, or before 1,200, the year 1,200, as they say, owing to the decrease in the amount of input proxy data. And yet uh, what makes it into this uh, summary for policymakers um, is uh, the median of those different reconstructions really sort of reflecting, if we go back, uh, the spread of the central estimate of those different proxies, but not the uncertainty on each one of those methods themselves. And that's where those uncertainties went. And what we're looking at is the uncertainties due to the choice of methods and the median estimate, um, as opposed to uh, the full uncertainty. So Jason and I want to talk a little bit about this full uncertainty. And in fact, the IPCC had done a pretty good job, uh, particularly in the last sort of previous two reports, um, in uh, trying to convey this uncertainty. Uh, so in 2001, the, the famous hockey stick was featured again in the SPM, um, a single reconstruction of the past thousand years. And there you can see the, the uncertainties really do blow up about before about sort of 1600. Uh, reflecting the challenges in doing a, a global scale, in this case, even just northern hemisphere scale reconstruction, given the relative paucity of high resolution proxy data. In 2007 and 2013, there was sort of more of a, a reconstruction democracy, if you will. Um, and the authors of those two uh, reports or the paleoclimate chapters in those two reports uh, used this way, this sort of relative agreement uh, between the reconstructions to convey that. I mean, you can actually see there's a, a fair amount of change between 2007 and 2013. Um, there's a deeper Little Ice Age, perhaps a warmer, uh, definitely a warmer medieval period, um, some more agreement sort of during the last, say, 500, 600 years, less agreement before then. And so it was, again, a little surprising that in 2021, the, the IPCC returned to sort of a singular representation of what we think we know about the climate of the common era. So, uh, sorry, in this paper, Jason and I sort of reviewed, you know, what we thought we, uh, or how well we knew the global mean annual temperatures over the common era. And I, I emphasize those words global and mean, because on top of the challenges that are faced by a declining number of proxy data going back in time, there's also the characteristics of those data in resolving global uh, annual mean temperatures. So we'll look at four different components of this, the spatial distribution of proxies, and their temporal extent, some aspects of seasonality and spectral property. Uh, I'll touch on methodological sensitivity uh, and the treatment and quantification of uncertainty. Um, one of the biggest issues we face when trying to do temperature reconstructions of the common era is the spatial temporal distribution of proxies. Uh, so this is a figure showing how those proxies change through time. Uh, you can really see the dominance of tree ring based uh, proxies um, certainly in the modern period, but even going back uh, into the first millennium, um, the bulk of the proxies are made up of, of trees, uh, so terrestrial uh, growing season sensitive proxies. Um, but as you get back in time, you also see that the sort of relative uh, representation of those proxies also changes. Tree rings, uh, not surprisingly, reduce. Glacier ice uh, is more uh, relatively uh, stable through time. And so the representation of proxies through time is actually changing. And we have relatively few temperature sensitive proxies in this database prior to about sort of 1000 CE. And you can even see the rapid 
uh, decline after about six or before 1600 CE. And you can look at this in space too. So in our best replicated time, um, again, you see uh, that there's a lot of tree ring chronologies. They are heavily weighted towards the uh, mid and high latitudes of uh, North America and Eurasia. Uh, we have some wonderful coral records, although uh, most of them are, are not long enough to extend very back far in time. Um, and then we have uh, glacial ice records as well. By the time you get back to 500 CE, this is what's left. A few long chronologies, most of these bristlecone pines in the Western US. Uh, you have some ice cores, both in Greenland and Antarctica, um, tropical ice cores. Um, but you really see that the corals are gone, the tree ring density is reduced, the tropics are well underrepresented, um, and the southern hemisphere is uh, still, uh, in both periods, less well represented than the northern hemisphere. Um, so what about the seasonality and spectral properties of these proxies? Well, Jason and I went in and we sort of looked at the proxies through time and, and uh, calculated some metrics. So the panel at the top labeled B shows you the median uh, latitude of those proxies. And you can see, except for the sort of most recent time when corals sort of pull the median latitude towards the tropics, we're talking about somewhere between about 30 and, and 50 degrees north latitude. Um, there is a widening of the inner quartile range you see uh, at before about 800 as the number of proxies drops and the presence of Antarctic ice cores. Two minutes, Tripti? Thought I had 20 minutes. Yeah, you do. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, similarly, uh, number of proxy records recording different seasons is actually relatively stable through time but heavily represented by summer proxies. So anywhere from uh, you know, somewhere in the, the 50 to 60% summer proxies, very few representing their local winter um, and uh, relatively few, so around 25% uh, being judged to be truly annual proxies. And there's a number of consequences to this, but one of them is that as you look at the sort of mean spectral properties of the proxies that are available, what you see is a sort of a decline in the higher frequency variability um, and uh, increasing dominance of the lower frequency variability. So that panel D, uh, the increasing dark red and the, the sort of uh, change or the weakening um, and the increase in the uh, light pink as you go back in time. So changing uh, uh, number of proxies, uh, changing spectral properties of these proxies. Um, if we sort of separate these proxies, as Emile Jay did, um, you also see some interesting behavior in the very lowest frequencies. So glacial, glacial ice, lake sediments, and marine sediments seem to have this sort of decline from uh, the sort of early part of the Common Era into the Little Ice Age, and then uh, the sort of rebound that comes uh, with anthropogenic warming and, and uh, the exit out of the Little Ice Age and into the period of, of modern anthropogenic warming. Uh, but tree rings don't have as clear a signal. There's a lot more decadal variability. Decline um, from the earliest part of the common era. So different proxies have these different spectral and long-term uh, behavior. Uh, Lauren Cl uh, Klippel also showed this uh, and uh, tried to sort of come up with some explanations for why this might be based on seasonality and the host of other things. Um, but still, these, these differences persisted. The marine and lake sediment proxies, the glacial ice, all had these sort of declines in a sort of millennial scale declines, while the tree rings were relatively flat. Um, and uh, in this uh, 2017 paper where we assembled all these proxy data, we did some very simple binning and compositing and sort of screening and sensitivity tests. And in most of these, not all of them, but in most of these, you saw um, evidence that uh, there was, particularly in the low resolution records, so the lake sediments and, and the ocean sediments, this kind of long-term decline, uh, but that the high resolution uh, records didn't really show this. And so if you think about then this sort of figure that was shown in the IPCC, the sort of um, low frequency figure from uh, the pages reconstruction in 2019, you do notice that it, there's this flattening out before 1000 CE. So where did those millennial scale trends go? Were they real? Were they an aspect of those proxies that was either uh, seasonal or part of the proxy system? Uh, I think some of that remains unknown. 
Um, there's a very nice paper by uh, Lucy Luce, Luce um, uh, in 2021, kind of tackling this question. And um, I'll call your attention uh, here uh, to these simulations uh, that were done with orbital forcing only using the CESM model. Um, and the top uh, topmost panel shows you sort of global temperature trends. But I want to focus on the sort of uh, red and blue plots there, land and sea in the middle, and then land only um, in the bottom. And what you see is uh, the expected temperature trend over uh, the sort of last millennium, um, depending on the season. And there's two boxes in there. And so the black boxes, uh, the heavy black line boxes show the sort of locations and seasonal window of the tree ring proxies that are in uh, Rob Wilson and I's N-Trend uh, compilation of temperature sensitive proxies. And then the dashed one, which might be harder to see is from the Arctic uh, 2K compilation. Uh, and a couple of things to draw your attention to, which is that uh, the N-Trend uh, network really samples a range of expected trends, right? Anything from that sort of early season uh, sort of May, June, even into July of either warming or, or neutral trends. And then that late season and uh, high and low latitude trends that come for sort of late July, August into September. So depending on the sensitivity of the proxies and their latitudes, you'd have a very different expectation of what that millennial scale trend might be. And so mixing these uh, over their different seasonal windows uh, could potentially obscure the millennial trend that we might expect there, depending again on season and latitude. Um, we also know, uh, and there's uh, some earlier papers by Nara Abram and Helen McGregor that show this quite nicely, that we would actually expect a cooling trend even uh, without the orbital forcing. And in fact, it's stronger with the other forcings because of volcanic eruptions. Uh, volcanic eruptions and their distribution through the last millennium are uh, in large part responsible for the expectation that we would have an all season, uh, particularly high latitude, but all latitude uh, cooling, at least over the last millennium. That's the low frequency. What about the highest frequencies? Well, what we uh, know is that different proxies do a different job of accurately re representing uh, volcanic eruptions. And we've actually known this for a long time. Um, we kind of had to relearn it. So if you go back to the late 90s, we've got two temperature reconstructions, one from Keith Briffa using what we call maximum late wood density. And Karen's gonna talk about um, a similar measurement to this maximum late wood wood density um, in a second. And then we have the MAN multi-proxy reconstruction from 1999. And what this is showing is the average response to very large volcanic eruptions. Uh, what you see is that there's sort of a muted to you know, weak signal in the multi-proxy MAN reconstruction but quite a nice strong uh, response in the Briffa wood density. We see the th same thing in more recent reconstructions. The earlier Dorigo et al. 2006 reconstruction uh, has sort of a muted, delayed, and, and um, weaker response. Leah Schneider's uh, MXD density only reconstruction has a nice sharp response and a quick recovery. And then Rob Wilson and my end trend reconstruction sort of has a little bit of both. It has a, a clear volcanic response because of the MXD, uh, but probably a, a longer tail of recovery due to the presence of tree ring width data. So even within the tree ring proxy, whether you use something like ring width or whether you combine multiple proxies or whether you focus on something like the maximum late wood density gives you a different result. Um, I also spoke again here about this uh, dominance of summer sensitive or growing season in many cases for trees, proxies. Um, and yet the pages 2K reconstruction, as reviewers have reminded us on multiple occasions, is a global reconstruction. Well, uh, can it be a global reconstruction? This is actually from the Emile J 2017 paper. And what it's showing is the, the local correlation between mean annual temperature and summer temperature. And while it's pretty good in some places like the tropics, um, it's not so good. It's a weak relationship over northern high latitude land areas, which is unfortunately where most of our proxies are, particularly the tree ring proxies that are summer sensitive. So we have to be careful in assuming that uh, we can do global reconstructions with uh, summer high latitude, sorry, global mean annual reconstructions with summer high latitude biased proxies. And in fact, uh, again, we've known this for a long time. Usually when you scratch the surface, you find that Keith Briffa um, already warned us about this. 
Um, and as Keith and Phil said, infer inferring annual climate change on the basis of summer responsive data is therefore highly questionable regarding, uh, regardless of spatial scale. So as Jason and I say, the results uh, that we have since sort of the, the hockey stick in, in the IPCC in 20, 2001 in the SPM, thanks Tripti, uh, the results continue to show that by the late 20th century, temperatures likely exceeded those of any time in at least the last millennium. That said, there are pretty big differences between earlier reconstructions like the Man at All hockey stick in 1999, uh, recent reconstructions by uh, Seb Gouillet, uh, Marcus Stoffel and their group, or the N-Trend group uh, with Rob Wilson, myself and others, uh, the host of IPCC AR5 reconstructions, when you, which you can see in light gray, and that Pages 2K uh, 2019 that was featured um, in the IPCC most recently. You see it has uh, lower variance, um, some very different uh, sort of uh, early medieval behavior, different responses to volcanic uh, eruptions. Um, and so there are real differences out there arising from some of these factors that I've been talking about. One of the biggest challenges, again, though, is uh, the proxy data themselves. They tend to be uh, summer biased, high latitude, and dominated by tree rings until you get back into the first millennium, where the first millennium presents a real challenge. So Jason and I made a few recommendations, and we'd be happy to talk about this during questions. Uh, we ask uh, the community to use and evaluate multiple reconstructions. So uh, one reconstruction, even if it's from a consortium, even if it's 2,000 years and purports to be global, mean, and annual, um, has positives, positives and negatives, as do any reconstruction. And so using and evaluating multiple reconstructions is important. Depending on what your purpose of using these reconstructions is, you uh, have to clearly define the intended uses. Using a multi-proxy smoothed uh, reconstruction or one that's dominated by tree ring width data is probably not as good for studying volcanic eruptions as a reconstruction that is dominated by the wood density proxies, like the one Karen's about to talk about. Uh, we're encouraging the whole community to continue to do spatial reconstructions. Uh, the spatial data that we can get um, is often a clue as to atmospheric circulation and where the strengths and weaknesses are in our reconstructions, just to name a few. And then always, 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 we got to go back to the data. New statistical techniques will only get us so far. We need more, better, and longer proxies, especially in the tropics and especially in the southern hemisphere. So with that, I'll leave you with this beautiful picture of the White Mountains in California and the ancient bristlecone pine forest. Uh, and I'll be happy to pass it over to Karen now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin, for the excellent talk. Um, now, maybe we can have a few minutes to take a couple of questions. Then we will uh, move to Karen's talk. Hopefully at the end, we will have more time for questions. Sounds great. Uh, Andreas. Go ahead. Thank you, Kevin, for this nice talk. Uh, well, since two thirds of the planet are covered by the ocean, uh, I am of course wondering about ocean data, which seem to be, in, I mean, you showed these two maps, like one in the later period, one in the earlier period. The earlier period had almost no ocean data. Although then in a later figure, you showed like 50 uh, records from ocean sediments. Can you talk a little bit about about that what yeah so um there's obviously a, a tremendous amount of ocean data out there covering different time scales um for the pages 2k purpose when we were trying to cover the last 2000 years uh things like uh you know whether the sediment core comes all the way to the present whether it has the sedimentation rate to resolve parts of the common era whether it has the um uh, age model precision to be able to use all sort of come into play um, a lot of the methods that were used in the 2019 paper that I showed you, and I'm not on that, I should say, um, so I can't speak to everything they did, um, but a lot of those methods require a pretty precise or exact annual age model or the ability to reasonably annualize. So um, one of the limitations in using the abundant ocean data that we do have comes down to resolution, age model control, and, and things like that. So there are uh, lower resolution marine records uh, from the common era in the database, but a lot of those were not able to be applied with the different methods that were used. Some of them were, some of them weren't. So um, 
Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, finding ways where we can use those data on these timescales effectively is also a really important thing. Uh, you know, we really, when it comes to data, we need all hands on deck, so to speak. Um, every bit of information that we can glean and use to constrain our understanding of, of the temperature history, you know, in the oceans, in the tropics, in the low latitudes uh, is really important. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, fun? Yeah. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, nice you. talk. Yeah. So I have a question. Like it's uh, maybe off the topic, but uh, so in addition to temperature, precipitation is also a very important uh, variable people are trying to reconstruct. It. Uh, but uh, uh, we know that temperature is uh, so far. The, I think is the most uh, easiest uh, variable to reconstruct. Uh, given what we have right now, given those limitations, uh, and presentation has a much weaker spatial covariance and it's more local. Uh, I'm just curious, what do you think of uh, precipitation uh, field reconstruction uh, with trillions? Do you think it's worth this uh, blurring or it's just another very doable at this moment? Yeah, that's a great question. I So my sense is, and Jason and I sort of uh, wrestled with whether to tackle this, and we decided we already had enough, uh, so we didn't sort of go into this and confine ourselves to temperature. But it's a really good point, and you're, everything you said uh, is exactly spot on. It makes uh, reconstructions of moisture, particularly on large scales, even harder. So my sense is that most uh, sort of field reconstructions have thus far sort of focused on the regional to continental scale. Um, and so said, okay, here we we feel like we've got enough proxies, uh, we've got an extensive network, the network is sensitive in a way to local hydroclimate that we think is reasonable, we've selected a metric. Um, but I think when you start to move to global uh, hydroclimate and regions where you don't um, have a lot of hydroclimate proxies, or we face the same issues I just mentioned to, to, to Andres, that we might have great lake sediment records, um, but maybe they're discrete, they sort of record uh, low stands and high stands or something. Question becomes, how do you incorporate those data? How do you deal with age model change? And, and we've tried to do some of this in, in the Horn of Africa and sort of the Great Lakes region of Africa with some of the higher resolution records. Um, and one of the things you really have to deal with is this time uncertainty. So any, you know, and this goes for temperature too, one big advance would be um, methods to really robustly and, and tractably and quickly use say ensembles or, or uh, directly incorporate age model uncertainty. Um, and you know that may come with a trade-off. It may mean that, okay, we only really trust our ability to resolve decadal or multi-decadal variability, and we're gonna have to leave the sort of you know, single year and flash droughts behind. So that's probably gonna represent a trade-off, but I think regional and continental scale is still a, a, a reasonable target for hydroclimate reconstructions. Thank you. Thanks, good to see you. Hey, in the interest of time, so we can move on to Karen's talk. So please take away. And uh, if you have questions for Kevin, you could either put it in the chat or we could, uh, you could ask the questions at the end. All right, great. Thank you guys. Um, so let me get started. Can you guys see okay? Okay, excellent. Well, thanks again. Um, I'm super happy to get to talk to you guys about what I've been working with over the last couple years. Uh, so just to add, it's not just me, it's, you know, I'm a piece of the puzzle, I think, in a large working group of people, not just in North America, but across the Northern Hemisphere, uh, working with this new tech technique called blue intensity, as Kevin mentioned, to kind of beef up uh, kind of our knowledge and our current understanding of how tree rings are able to capture temperature. And if we can do you know, a better job in the future at incorporating these new techniques as they come up to improve our regional and local scale paleo temperature estimates through time. Um, so thinking about you know, climate proxies from tree rings, in North America, where I primarily work, we're really lucky in the way that we're really well replicated in terms of, you know, time and space in terms of trees being able to capture hydroclimate variability. And so this is evident with, you know, Ed Cook's Living Blended Drought Atlas, as well as this new seasonal precipitation atlas. 
And of course, you know, tree rings are valuable in this, this way that we have these annual uh, resolution proxies. And so, however, uh, we do have this relative paucity of temperature proxies from tree rings um, in North America, especially as Kevin mentioned, this is not just you know, unique to North America, but at the lower latitudes, we have kind of these problems getting these um, really robust records of, of temperature from tree rings. Uh, but where this has been able to be done in the past is limited to high latitude and high elevation locations primarily from conifers, and then the metrics, which I'll really spend a lot more time talking about, and kind of some of the reasons why we have this, this pattern, um, is because of the metrics we're using. So predominantly ring width has been used in the past, um, until, you know, semi-recently, last couple decades, this emphasis on a new technique, rather than measuring radial growth, we're now measuring densimetric growth from year to year. This uh, technique called maximum ring density, or MXD, as I'll refer to for the rest of the talk. Um, and then this newer technique, uh, which is largely related to ring density, and in fact gives kind of this representative measure of annual ring density, a technique that's a visible light technique called blue intensity, or BI. Um, so the emphasis on MXD in the 1980s and 90s, really for North America, comes from the work from uh, Briffa and Schweingruber. This hemispheric scale development um, of this network of tree ring chronologies that are sensitive to uh, summer temperatures. And so why this emphasis on MXD? Well, unlike measuring radial growth, how wide or how narrow a ring is each year, these guys are looking at you know, how dense or not dense a ring is. And this is related to the amount of cell wall material that's deposited each year after the cessation of radial growth. And so this image here is just showing you kind of what that looks like for those of you guys that aren't familiar with tree ring growth, right? The, the dark dense parts here, that's that secondary cell wall. The idea that the warmer the temperatures is more favorable for the metabolic pathways that make these secondary wall cell, uh, cell wall material. And so also kind of thinking about, well, why MXD over ring width? I'll come back to this figure in a couple slides. But what I've done here is compiled a, a tree ring network of Engelmann spruce chronologies, and they're arranged by latitude. So we've got the highest most latitude, 48 degrees north, and then uh, southwards to 33 degrees latitude. So what I've done, these are total ring width chronologies. I'm looking at the climate response based on crew T max and T mean, and it's just a Pearson's correlation. Um, for current season, growing season, so starting January through September. And what kind of the, the issue is, is, you know, radial growth, we have this dominant limiting factor of the amount of cells that a tree is going to put on is dominantly driven by how much moisture availability there is. And so you have these kind of competing hydroclimate temperature interactions for that dominant limiting factor on growth. And as you can see by this figure here, we really with the exception for a couple tree ring chronologies, don't get a strong positive temperature response across this entire latitudinal gradient. And again, this is with Engelmann spruce. So one species, but over a pretty wide spanning area in North America. And kind of this trend between the decreased response overall of ring width in comparison to ring density, um, you can see this at the hemispheric scale as well, which, you know, Kevin, mentioned the NTRAN data set that they put together. And as you can see with this histogram here on the bottom, you still see that the ring width only chronologies kind of dominate the lower end of the explained variance over their calibration period, whereas the composites between MXD and then MXD and BI and ring width uh, tend to have a stronger signal. Uh, so that said, you know, we do have kind of differences in tree ring growth chronologies in their response to temperature, but also we have these spatial gaps as well. Um, so that kind of was the inspiration and the jumping off point for a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years for my dissertation into what I'll be doing at, at University of Tennessee. Um, so MXD has worked really well, but it does have its limits. And this is something that even, you know, Schweingruber wrote about frequently. Um, it's pretty expensive and it's pretty time consuming. And so if we want to have these large scale efforts to not just push our paleo temperature records back through time, but also update them, it might not be the exact, um, I guess, or the, the ideal approach for doing this. And so that kind of gets on to this idea of switching from these x-ray based techniques that look at density to these visible light techniques. 
Um, and so kind of to demonstrate what that kind of looks like, it might not be such a linear jump to some people. Um, if we start by looking at just one annual ring, so I'm highlighting 1954. And for this example, I'm just going to look at the late wood portion of the ring. So what that looks like in terms of ring density, well, if we break down the parts, the two basic geometric parts of a cell, right, you've got the cell lumen, the space, and you've got that cell wall material. And this is, you know, consistent um, documented in the wood technology literature and the wood physiological literature. And it's it's kind of interesting it, being able to incorporate uh, those two bodies of work now into tree rings to kind of better understand what we're looking at, um, the differences between these two metrics. And so then we can see that cell wall area is positively correlated with the density, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but then it's not until the work of Shepard et al. in North America, he's working in Maine with red spruce, where he starts to look at, you know, can you say, can you make a, a relationship between actual x-ray densitometry and visible light reflectance across a ring? And so what he's able to show is that late wood density and late wood brightness, or the amount of reflected light in that late wood portion, they both correlate with April and May average temperatures. And they're, the two metrics themselves are positively related as well. Um, so then a few years later, we finally get uh, the work by Danny McCarroll uh, from 2002, where he's able to say maximum density has a strong negative relationship with the blue minimum reflectance. So that's from the visible spectrum, just that blue wavelet of light. Um, so if you invert it, in theory, you can have this kind of surrogate parameter for this MXD. Um, that, was, that was kind of the thought at the time. And so kind of how that translates to today in the way that I've been using it. If we look at what blue intensity is, well, simply it's the measure of reflected blue wavelet light across an annual ring. So if we think of the visible spectrum breaking that down. And so you can do this with a camera or a scanner. Um, so using a scanner or a, you know both, when you scan an image of a core, you end up getting something that looks like this, right? It's This is an Engelmann spruce uh, radial section. But when you look at what that means in terms of additive color, which is how we're actually collecting data from these uh, pieces of hardware, you have the red, green, and blue channels. Of course, with blue intensity, we're only interested in looking at that annual reflected value of blue light. And so that is essentially what you end up getting per ring. And you can make a time series like you would MXD or tree ring width. And so kind of to show you how that relates to how we can make these temperature proxy records. Um, if we look at, again, that similar example, 1954, looking at the late wood portion. In tree rings, we talk about marker years, right? If you've got an exceptionally dry year, you might have a narrow band. Well, in this case, it's not always as visually obvious as this example here, um, but you might have, say, later, uh, lighter late wood bands, which is what we're seeing here with 1954 compared to the rings around it. The inverse, 1958, for example, is pretty dark and dense looking. Well, if you look at the relationship between these actual BI measurements versus temperature, you see 1954, in fact, for its location. This one, for example, is Revelstoke, British Columbia. It's one of the coldest years on records in terms of summer uh, maximum temperatures. Inversely, 1958 prior to 2021 was the warmest on record. So I hope this example kind of clarifies any questions you, you might have about that. And, and again, I'm happy to talk more about the kind of ins and outs of, of blue intensity and how it works in the future. And so kind of my introduction to how all this really kind of built upon itself. Well, I was really inspired by this idea of having this tree ring density network, uh, the Briffa and Schweingruber network. But kind of the idea of being able to build upon it with MXD seemed a little bit unrealistic for me. Um, and then thinking about the spatial gaps in the N-Trend network, um, fast forward to summer of 2017, this is me as a new grad student uh, learning from Rob Wilson, this technique, blue intensity. And at this point, it had really only been used, I think, once or twice in North America uh, for a tree ring temperature reconstruction. And so I was really inspired by, by his teachings there. And so, as I mentioned with the Paul Shepard paper a few slides prior, he had done some work in the 1990s looking at light reflectance in Maine with red spruce. 
well, you know, being inspired from that summer at NADAF, I went and uh, I tried blue intensity on a kind of southern range periphery of red spruce in the Smoky Mountains, not far from where I'll be teaching, which is kind of cool, full circle. Um, but it, we found that we had strong positive relationships between the late wood blue intensity and the late summer uh, growing temp, yeah, late summer temperatures. And so, you know, this was really exciting, but of course, like anything in science, you know, you, you need replication to kind of say, well, is this, is this a mistake, you know, that sort of thing. And, and to be really confident in what was going on and what the trees were telling us. And so uh, building upon uh, much of the Briffa and Schweingruber network, starting in 2018, I went and started recollecting a lot of the Briffa Schweingruber sites for my dissertation, which led to four years, four very long summers of a lot of field sampling to build this tree ring blue intensity network. And so revisiting kind of that figure that I showed earlier, showing the difference between late wood blue intensity, which are the chronologies on the top, and their total ring with counterparts on the bottom. Again, just a simple Pearson's correlation for um, current year temperature. You can see the late wood blue intensity, especially in the late summer months, it has really strong, positive, and temporally stable uh, relationships with temperature, whereas the ring with counterparts do not. Um, so this was really promising in terms of, can we use this new metric in uh, previously unexplored locations uh, to get these perhaps refined uh, temperature reconstructions? And so through the course of my graduate uh, work, I was able to uh, develop these regional reconstructions of maximum and mean summer temperature. Uh, so these were for the Intermountain West, and more recently, we got a millennial length uh, temperature record for the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so kind of fast forward to, to present times, what I've been working on at Lamont with uh, a bunch of folks from all over, which has been really exciting is this synthesis of not just mine and others work with blue intensity, but with all the, the ring density and kind of to, to see if we can make these spatial field reconstructions that are, uh, a, you know, a better, I guess, tool to, to answer certain questions, as Kevin was mentioning, right? It's like being able to be explicit with um, the type of reconstruction you're using um, for the for really specific questions. So for in this case, I was really interested in this idea of competing hydroclimate signals um, in the tree ring records for Western North America. So I've been working on developing what I've called the Western North America Temperature Atlas. So I'm basically using density and blue intensity to make this half degree gridded reconstruction of uh, summer temperatures back through time. And so a huge part of what I've also been doing is going back and looking at all the, the density data um, and seeing, well, not just looking at maximum late wood density, but seeing what other climatic information we can get from other density records in other parts of the ring. This includes early wood density, minimum density. And the same is true with blue intensity as well. So, so far I've really kind of just talked about the use of late wood blue intensity, but as you would expect with, you know, uh, density, right? There is so much more information potentially that the trees are telling you um, that I think is worth a lot more exploration and, and refinement in the future. And so looking at just the response, the density predictors versus the blue intensity predictors, we can see that, you know, we do have these seasonal differences among predictors themselves. And I think as what Kevin was saying, like more replication and, and more kind of chances to look at uh, these similar parameters in across space, we kind of get a better idea of not just the biological basis of these new predictors, but also kind of a better understanding of how these, these parameters kind of work um, in a multi-proxy fashion. Um, and so looking a little bit at this gridded reconstruction, some results uh, for the calibration verification statistics, we're actually able to explain uh, quite a bit of variance um, over our calibration uh, verification period. Um, so we've got so far pretty pretty good skill of this reconstruction in places where before we really haven't been able to do so. Um, and again, I don't know if I said it before, but these, these temperature estimates are based on positive relationships um, between tree growth and, and current year temperatures, which again is, is really exciting and, and kind of a pretty new development. 
Um, and just kind of looking at scale of this reconstruction so far, um, not only do we have good calibration verification, but the spatial patterns of the leading modes of temperature variability were able to really capture in these reconstructions as well, which was really exciting. Um, so kind of just showing that further. And then, you know, so these are summertime reconstructions. So being able to, to see, well, you know, what is the signal of volcanic cooling across space? So um, we're looking pretty good so far in, in terms of uh, current year response following major volcanic um, eruptions uh, for summertime cooling. And this is across the region of North Western North America. And what's particularly surprising is even at these lower latitudes, so this fourth leading mode here, uh, we're you know at 30 degree, 30 to 32 degrees latitude. Um, we're getting reliable temperature estimates where before it just has not really been able to, to happen with tree rings. So this was very, very encouraging. Um, and then also thinking back to that original work with MXD, trying to use this new and developing parameter to kind of understand how MXD behaves as well. Being able to compare the blue intensity based reconstructions with these pre existing reconstructions. Well, not only are we able to kind of use BI as kind of these pseudo proxy updates to MXD, but when we combine them, we're able to also push our reconstructions back through time, which is also pretty exciting. And so, for the really specific question that I'm kind of looking at now with this example, um, is how we can parse out the relationship between hydroclimate variability and temperature back through time using tree rings. So as I mentioned, right, this reconstruction is using positive relationships between um, current year temperatures and tree ring growth. As such, it's also wholly data independent of the living blended drought atlas and the seasonal precipitation atlas. So that's also kind of uh, pretty exciting to say we can do this independent evaluation of paleo estimates through time with tree rings. Um, and then lastly, kind of the bigger picture of where I'm going is, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not just me. This is, um, I get to be the ringleader. It feels like some days of, of a huge group of people working for this common goal of uh, what we will eventually be calling the, the full North American temperature atlas. And so trying to refine these BI metrics even more so and trying them on new species in different places to hopefully come up with the continental scale um, gridded reconstruction. And this has really involved just a ton of people from different, um, I guess, subfields of, of uh, dendrochronology, whether it's dendroclimate, the archeological people um, kind of helping us out, finding these historical samples as old sources of, of paleoclimate information. So um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I am actually extremely optimistic um, at our abilities so far and kind of the directions moving forward. Um, blue intensity, I'll just kind of uh, wrap this up with, it's not just, you know, North America, but um, over especially the Northern Hemisphere, this technique has just absolutely exploded over the last five or so years. If we look at the current or almost current global state of the blue intensity network, if we look at, you know, from Danny McCarroll's initial work in 2002 to 2017, you know, starting in, in uh, Northern Europe, these high latitude places, but uh, in the last five years alone, just the amount of work that's been done is incredible. And this is not just point by point locations. This is also um, experimenting and refinement with different species, especially Rob Wilson's uh, recent work looking in the Southern Hemisphere with just a multitude of new species is, is really exciting. And I'm excited to, to see as this to see this grow. Um, that said, BI is a pretty new uh, technique that as kind of this new technique, there's a lot of refinement um, and metadata and, and tracking, I think that really needs to, to continue as we move forward with this proxy record. Um, and this starts with sample collection um, and kind of making sure that, you know, we are um, moving forward and continuing to refine this, this method in a way that you know, um, is somewhat ubiquitous across the lab groups working together. So starting from sample collection to data stewardship at the end, there's a lot um, to be refined and to be examined and tested and, and replicated. Um, and my hope is that, you know, the relative accessibility of this method will allow for that in the future. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and stop.
Thank you, Karen, for showing us this exciting uh, new research. Okay, um, does anyone have questions? You can either raise your hand or put it in the, in the chat box. I hey, actually had a question. That was a great series of talks. Um, for Karen, um, I noticed that when you plotted the global map of blue intensity uh, chronologies, um, there are a lot of gymnosperms on that. So I was wondering if there are interspecific um, considerations and if there are some taxa that might not be well suited to this technique. Totally, yeah. And so I think, you know, starting with conifers, it has a lot to do with, you know, you've got that late wood and you've got the early wood differentiation, um, but it's also color of the wood as it's a visible light technique. You have to deal with these biases, not just from, you know, differences in growth um, and the trends when we talk about detrending, right? Well, now you have trends in color. Um, and so trying to get something that's ubiquitous across early wood, late wood, um, in terms of heartwood, sapwood um, changes, resin ducts, uh, things like I've seen uh, a couple folks trying to work on uh, oak, blue intensity with oak, and I'm not quite sure how they get around all the vessels and, and everything, but uh, yeah, there's definitely, there's people working on it. So um, I think Milo Shreedval is also um, trying to get around this idea of color bias by basically making um, what he's calling surface intensity. It's it's a composite black and white image where in theory, if that works out and he's able to replicate that among different species, you no longer have this kind of color issue. So hopefully that opens the door for new species and such. But... Awesome, thank you. Hey, Xiao Jing. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin uh, and uh... Karen for the wonderful talks. Uh, I have one uh, quick question for Karen. And you show the EOF analysis uh, for the response for uh, the volcanic eruption. And it's very interesting to see that the cooling response is like consistent throughout the EOF1 to EOF4. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, is there any like explanation for the spatial pattern difference uh, to the cooling uh, response? like? why there's like uh, the spatial pattern uh, through UF1, UF4 uh, show the different like spatial pattern to the uh, volcanic cooling. Yeah, so I think certainly part of it is the difference in, in uh, the seasonal response and the strength of the response of the chronologies at each grid point. Um, so, so I'm thinking in terms of um, like the Southern kind of range periphery chronologies. It's, you don't get this um, as strong of a response as you might in the Pacific Northwest in terms of their ability, the tree's ability to capture temperature. Um, so that's, that's probably part of it. And then I think it's also got to do with probably the distribution of chronologies um, kind of factoring into that. Obviously there's some pretty big spatial gaps. Um, so I showed the, I think it was, uh, EOF for his kind of into Mexico and into Eastern, um, or sorry, Western Texas, you don't really have a ton of tree ring chronologies there. So you're relying from chrono on chronologies that are further away. I think that's also part of it too. There's just increased uncertainty there as well. Um, Kevin, jump in if, uh, <laughs> if you have anything to add. I think that's a little bit like, so your wheelhouse. <laughs> Yeah, I think you covered it pretty well. I th you know, probably one of the big things is that some of those, while the while the rotated EOF analysis finds regions because that's what it does, um, some of those regions are probably uh, sharing data, sharing spatial covariance that's larger than the the region that the rotated wants to find. So, um, and I also think you know, given the given this the magnitude of some of those eruptions and the impact on North America, so 1600, 1601, um that there's some pretty strong signals that are probably yeah field wide and that's really driving that but i think i think karen got them all right so. yeah i think if we were to look at you know the continental scale when that final atlas is complete you know it, we might we might see some more interesting differences <laughs> so yeah thank you and i have another question like simplex like tree is more sensitive to 
summer temperature and maybe also summer precipitation. So does that mean like tree rain can give us a better idea about the summer phenomena? For example, like the North American summer monsoon, like to reconstruction, yes. things like that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, I think the bulk of what I'm looking at with the temperature, it's these parameters that come truly from the late wood port of, of the ring. And so when you think about not only when the lignification or the, the densification of the ring is happening, it's in the late summer season. So it kind of makes sense. The biological memory of blue intensity and density is not the same as say ring width, right? So it's gonna be more of an, I think an immediate response. Um, so that is kind of a limitation as you know, Kevin was mentioning, right? I wouldn't use blue intensity, especially late with blue intensity to make a annual reconstruction um, of temperature. It's definitely <laughs> limited to, to summer seasons. That said though, I mean, with the examination of other metrics, say if you start to look at the early wood and you see an improved response, say into spring temperature. Um, so yeah, I would say as a whole for now, with what I've shown in North America, we really are focused on summer season um, as like the predominant um, mm -hmm. season. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe Kai has a question about um, the temperature trend over the last uh, uh, millennials. So uh, in the past, I think people have used the paleoclimate data simulation approach. And uh, there might be a couple of products out there. So maybe could you please comment on uh, how reliable those are or what are the like, perspectives we could improve as those products? Is that to, to me or Karen? Um, maybe Kevin, you can start. Yeah. Um, so I think we've we've continued to learn a lot since you know the late 1990s about some of the the strengths and weaknesses of our our reconstructions. Um, I I think you know especially when we think about how to do sort of model data comparison, um, keeping some of the the sort of signal biases you know summer sensitive. Um, the potential that that given the latitude and the seasonal sensitivity, we we might expect, you know, in different chronologies and different locations, different orbital signals, um, whether it's tree ring width or density or BI, we might expect to have um, volcanic signals. So I think, you know, um, the two recommendations we sort of made about um, being cognizant of the strengths and weaknesses of, of the underlying proxy data is important. Um, and then, you know, more generally, not just selecting one of these reconstructions. So even if it's the latest one, even if it says it's annual mean, global mean, um, you know, all of these reconstructions have made choices. Some of those choices are are not well constrained, right? This isn't, um, this isn't, Sort of something where where all the the things are sort of come from come to us from frequentist statistics. We're making choices that we think are reasonable, and different groups can make different reasonable assumptions. So I think the use of ensembles, whether they're ensembles of opportunity, uh, using all the available reconstructions, or what we're moving towards in end trend is generating our own ensemble. So you know, uh, ten or sorry, a hundred, two hundred thousand um, possible reconstructions reflecting different choices, different data uh, selection and things like that. Um, you know, that provides a way, you know, perhaps particularly with the modeling community to um, have ensembles of models and then ensembles of, of reconstructions. And, and that may make the, the act of, um, or the, the process of doing comparisons between paleoclimate uh, modeling and, you know, however paleoclimate reconstructions can best be used at least more robust or, or, or maybe perhaps better said that a, a fuller accounting for uncertainties. Hey, thank you. So we are at the hour, unless Karen has something to add. Nope. <laughs> okay, let's thank both speakers again for the exciting uh, research. And, uh, 
we won't have webinars in the summer, and then we will restart in the fall. So stay tuned for the uh, future webinars. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thanks. <laughs>